Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Sunday, the last day of the um, ASHNR 2020 virtual uh, conference. Happy to be here. Um, if you were here yesterday morning, um, you know the plan. Uh, we're going to be looking at some video presentations for a number of the case of the day presentations. And this uh, morning, we're going to begin with case number six. And this is going to be presented by Dr. Jenny Soon from University of California, Irvine. Hope you enjoy this, and we will see you next year. If you're interested in um, presenting next year in a case of the day, please uh, reach out to me, and we will see if we can find a place for you. Okay, thank you so much. Enjoy. Hi, I'm Jennifer Sohn from the University of California, Irvine Medical Center. This is a 21-year-old male with blurry vision when looking to the left, headaches, hyposmia, and nasal obstruction for one year. On physical exam, he has left globe proptosis and left monocular diplopia. What is the diagnosis? This is a case of chondrosarcoma centered in the sinonasal cavities. The typical imaging features of chondrosarcoma are shown in the top left panel. The CT demonstrates ring and arc calcification within the mass, as well as osseous erosion of the ethmoid roof. The T2 weighted MR image in the top right shows T2 hyperintense signal of the mass, with the yellow arrow pointing to orbital extension abutting the left globe. The T1 weighted MR image in the bottom left shows bilateral pterygopalatine fossa involvement, and the post contrast T1 MR image in the bottom right shows intracranial extension along the anterior cranial fossa. Chondrosarcoma is a locally aggressive indolent tumor which is often large on presentation. The patient had typical symptoms related to local regional involvement of the mass, including nasal obstruction and vision changes. The most common location of this tumor is in the long bones and pelvis with rare involvement in the head and neck. There is a slight male predilection and peak incidence ranges from 30 to 60 years of age, with the median age around 40. The key imaging findings are the high T2 signal because of high water content, ring and arc calcification on CT because of chondroid matrix, and curvilinear enhancement on post-contrast MRI, which corresponds to fibrovascular bundles interspersed between cartilaginous regions. Chondrosarcoma can be seen in association with Mifuchi syndrome, Allier's disease, and Paget's disease. Differential considerations include chondroma, osteosarcoma, and chordoma. Of note, the distinction between chondroma and low-grade chondrosarcoma is often a diagnostic dilemma and relies on histological criteria such as nuclear atypia, cellularity, and mitotic index. The patient in this case underwent endoscopic gross total resection of the, of the mass, which turned out to be a grade two chondrosarcoma. The hospital course was complicated by a CSF leak requiring operative repair. Since his surgery, the patient is doing well and his left globe proptosis and diplopia have resolved. After discussion with the interdisciplinary treatment team, the plan is for the patient to undergo fractionated proton radiation therapy. Hello everyone. My name is Kavya Murchia. I'm currently an Interventional Radiology Fellow at SUNY Upstate in Syracuse, New York. I finished my Neuroradiology Fellowship at SUNY last year. Thank you, Dr. Phil Chapman and ASHNR for giving me this opportunity to present the case of the day. So now on to our case. This is a 35-year-old who presented with headache, dizziness, and left extremity in coordination. CT and MRI images were obtained for further evaluation. From left to right, we see the first three images in the upper column show non-contrast CT images in axial plane, and the fourth image shows T1-weighted axial MRI image. The bottom column shows first image of T2-weighted image in axial plane, followed by post-catalinium images in axial and coronal planes. So what is the diagnosis? 
based on the images and the history provided. This case illustrates radiation-induced undifferentiated sarcoma of greater wing of sphenoid following childhood retinoblastoma. A beautiful hint to diagnosis in this case is prosthetic globe on the right as well as on the left. This patient had history of bilateral retinoblastoma treated with radiation during childhood. The right prosthetic globe is seen on the first image indicated by the yellow arrow. The second image shows heterogeneously enhancing soft tissue mass arising from the right greater wing of synoid indicated by the red arrow. The third image as we can see shows extracranial and intracranial extension indicated by the green arrow. The key facts of radiation induced sarcoma are it can originate in either the irradiated bone or soft tissues after a period of latency which could be at least two years. Radiation induced sarcoma has a poor prognosis. Regarding the patient outcome in this case, this patient underwent wide local excision of the mass involving the greater wing of synoid and received subsequent radiation to the region without obvious recurrent disease on follow up at six months. Thank you everyone for your time and this wonderful opportunity. Hello to everyone at the ASHNR. My name is Charlotte Taylor. I'm a neuroradiologist at the University of Mississippi Medical Center, and here's the explanation to my case of the day. First of all, I would like to thank Phil Chapman at the ASHNR for inviting me to present my interesting case. I would also like to thank my mentor and section chief Todd Nichols for his guidance on selecting this case. This is a case of 12-year-old female twin sisters with a history of multiple dental surgeries to remove dental masses. Twin number one presents to ENT clinic with bilateral cheek swelling. Twin number two presented with severe nasal obstruction. For the imaging findings, we have a CT of the face of both twins with bone algorithm images shown here which show nearly identical, large, expansile, well-circumscribed fibrosis masses involving the maxilla and mandible bilaterally. These fill and obstruct the maxillary sinuses. They have a ground glass and ossified matrix, and in twin number two, cause severe narrowing and obstruction of the bilateral nasal cavities, which is worse on the right side. So here we have a case of multiple expansile fibrosis lesions with multi-quadrant jaw involvement in pediatric aged twins, which strongly suggests an underlying genetic component of their disease. Differential diagnosis includes polyostotic fibrous dysplasia, which also features expansile fibrosis lesions with a ground glass matrix. Cherubism typically presents in infants with facial deformity and on imaging show multi-quadrant expansile radiolucent lesions of the maxilla and mandible. Florid cemento-osseous dysplasia can also have multi-quadrant involvement, but the lesions are more sclerotic than those shown in our case. Multiple ossifying fibromas have a very similar appearance to our case. Familial gigantiform cementomas also cause expansile fibrosis lesions with multi-quadrant jaw involvement in pediatric age patients. And this is the diagnosis in our case. Familial gigantiform cementomas are rare fibrosis lesions presenting in young children. These cause massive expansile lesions involving multiple quadrants of the jaw. Inheritance is autosomal dominant. These present clinically with facial deformity and dental malocclusion. Histologically, these are benign and are similar to multiple other fibrosis lesions. Surgical management is the mainstay of treatment, but can be challenging due to rapid regrowth of lesions. Wide local resection is performed for symptomatic and for cosmetic relief. For patient outcomes, twin number one underwent resection of the bilateral maxillary tumors and bilateral maxillary antrostomies. She subsequently developed epiphoria from nasolacrimal duct obstruction on the left due to an enlarging tumor. This was treated with excision and dacrocystorhinostomy. 
Twin number two also went resection of the right maxillary tumor to relieve the nasal obstruction and subsequently underwent excision of the left maxillary tumor three months later. Dacker's sister rhinostomy was also performed at that time due to a nasal lacrimal duct obstruction. In conclusion, these fibro-osseous lesions of the jaw have significant imaging and pathologic overlap. In isolation, we will not be able to diagnose the exact pathology of these lesions and can only describe their location, their mass effect, and the fact that they are fibro-osseous in nature. The key for diagnosis in this case was the family history of these lesions involving twins, which was documented in the EMR. This concludes my case. Thank you very much to the ASHNR for the opportunity to present my case. If anyone has any questions or would like to contact me, my email is listed below. Thanks. Hello everyone. We are excited to present this case of the day at the 2020 American Society of Head and Neck Radiology virtual meeting. Thank you to Dr. Phil Chapman and the ASHNR Programming Committee for this opportunity to share our case. I am Pranay Sanku, a radiology resident at Yale New Haven Hospital in New Haven, Connecticut. I worked with Dr. Amit Mahajan in the Yale Department of Radiology to present this patient's case. So let's get started. This patient is a 30-year-old male with a history of quadriplegia due to distant gunshot wound to the cervical spine who presented to medical attention due to a firm left neck mass and worsening left neck pain. On initial physical examination, he was noted to have fullness of his left neck without any focal tenderness or fluctuance to his neck. Of note, no abnormality was reported on the patient's last MRI cervical spine from three years prior to presentation, which was obtained to follow up and reevaluate cervical cord edema related to his gunshot injury. Representative images from the MRI are shown here. From left to right, we have an axial T2 uh, and axial T1 pre-contrast images, a coronal T1 post-contrast image, and an axial T1 post-contrast image. For comparison, we also have the axial T2, axial T1 pre-contrast, and axial T1 post-contrast images, where in retrospect, a finding can be made. For this case of the day, what are important differential diagnoses to consider? So this case demonstrates extra abdominal desmoid tumor, or desmoid type fibromatosis. Coronal, coronal T1 post-contrast and uh, axial T2 images demonstrate a homogeneously enhancing T2 hyperintense, well-circumscribed mass without any lesional necrosis or surrounding muscle edema, which is centered in the left levator scapula musculature. The mass has enlarged significantly over the three years since the initial examination where it was read as negative. So what are some key facts associated with extra abdominal desmoid tumor? It's a benign, rare, locally aggressive tumor, which occurs most commonly in the first decade of life. It can be seen in the setting of Gardner syndrome, which also features familial adenomatous polyposis, osteomas, and papillary thyroid cancer. When there is extra abdominal desmoid tumor that presents in the head and neck, it most commonly is in the supraclavicular fossa and in the neck muscles, which is what we see with our patient here. These tumors can adhere to surrounding structures, including muscle, nerves, and arteries. So early detection is key in minimizing surgical morbidity and mortality. The most distinctive imaging features that we see are diffuse enhancement and hyperintense signal on T2-weighted imaging. Although this is very variable, and the amount of T2 hyperintense signal can depend a lot on the amount of fibrous content within the tumor. Other differential diagnoses to consider are the malignant fibrosarcoma, which once again may have imaging overlap, but most typically can be differentiated through the presence of central necrosis or certainly if there is metastatic disease. Congenital myofibromatosis is another diagnostic consideration, 
but we'll note that the mass did increase in size from the examination three years prior, and this patient's 30 years old, so he does not fit the ideal age demographic for this condition. Another common condition is uh, a schwannoma. And while this is a, a diagnostic consideration, the homogeneity of the T2 signal uh, does sway against schwannoma given the size of the mass. And ultimately on biopsy, this was shown to be a desmoid type tumor. So how did the patient do? He underwent subtotal resection of the tumor with a small portion left behind given the proximity to adjacent neurovascular structures. He was then referred to radiation oncology for consideration for adjuvant neotherapy, uh, adjuvant radiation therapy. This was foregone though due to the patient's baseline paresis, which the radiation oncologist felt put him at too large of a risk for worsening uh, motor function. The patient subsequently underwent further debulking and then was treated with adjuvant serafinib and we can report that he's currently in remission. So thank you all for following along with our case of the day.